All right, so today we are moving on to 2.3 notes. Um, and in section 2.3, we're really just going to be focusing on the conditional statement part, not so much the biconditionals. So the first thing we need to do is talk about what a conditional statement is. So a conditional statement is a statement that's in the form of if, and then statement P, then statement Q. So it is an if then statement, right? So we've talked about these in science class um, as a hypothesis, right? So um, again, it has if a statement comma then another statement. So typically uh, the notation for this is a P arrow Q, right? So if P then Q. So that it means that P implies Q, right? So um, P is referred to as the hypothesis. And Q is the conclusion. Okay, so let's take these statements and write them as a conditional statement. So we're going to write it in if then form. So let's start with A. So it, or it says there are no clouds in the sky, so it is not raining. So to write that as an if then statement, we would say if there are no clouds in the sky, then it is not raining. Okay, so again, we've got to put it in if then form. So we have if and then. All right, so there's A. So let's move on to B. So school will be canceled when a blizzard hits. So you can say if a blizzard hits, you don't have to necessarily do it in the same order that the sentence starts in. If a blizzard hits, then school be, then school will be canceled. So again, if then. And then C is a little bit trickier, right? So it says a triangle has three sides. So you can say if a figure is a triangle, if a polygon is a triangle, then it has three sides. Again, so we're putting those in if then statements. So now let's look at the truth table for conditional statements. Okay, so let's think about this. So um, if P is true, right? So if P is true, then Q is true. That means that entire conditional statement would be true. All right, so if P is true, and Q is false, then our statement is false. Right, so then if P is false and Q is true, then our entire conditional statement is considered to be true. And then if P is false and Q is false, then our conditional is also false. So our first two, I feel like, are fairly easily understood. These two are a little bit tricky to grasp. So let's kind of think about this in the examples we did before. So in example A, we said, if there are no clouds in the sky, then it is not raining. Both of those are true, so our conditional is true. All right, so then let's look at our triangle example. So if a figure is a triangle, then it has three sides. Both of those are true. So if we said if a figure is a square, which can be true, right? A figure can be a square, then it has three sides. That's false. So that's why that one would be false. Um, and then moving down on page 66, let's look... at some of those examples. 
All right, so let's look at this scenario here. So it says, Coach Jones promises players, if you win the championship game, then I will buy you a steak dinner. So we're talking about the truth value of the statement in each case. So, statement A, the coach bought the team a steak dinner after they won the championship. So, that would be true, right? Because they won the championship and their conclusion was satisfied, so they got the steak dinner. All right, so that's like our first example in the truth table. B, the coach did not buy dinner after the team won the championship game. So the first part was true, the second part was false, so that makes that whole statement false, right? Because they won, but they didn't get their steak dinner. Looking at C, the coach bought the team a steak dinner, but they after they lost the championship game, right? So the first part was false, they didn't win, but they still got their steak dinner. So that statement is technically true, right? Because the first part, we didn't meet the hypothesis. They didn't win the championship. So the then part of that statement doesn't have any meaning at that point. So it doesn't matter if that first part is false. If that first part is false, regardless of what happens next, it's going to be your entire statement will be true. Right? So then D, it makes sense that that is a true statement, right? Because the coach didn't buy dinner after they lost the championship game. So, they didn't win, so they didn't get dinner. That's why that would be true. I know it's weird because you think, well, if both parts are false, and it has to be false. But really, that's what makes it true because they didn't win, so they wouldn't get that expected conclusion of getting that steak dinner. Right. So if we have a conditional statement, sometimes we can write some different conditional statements from that. So the first one of those I want to talk about is what we call the converse. So the converse happens when you switch the hypothesis and conclusion. So you switch P and Q. All right. So again, if our original statement is if P, then Q, then the converse would be if Q then P. So you're switching that statement around. Okay, the inverse is the next one. And when you are writing the inverse of a conditional, you are negating both the hypothesis and the conclusion. Right. So again, if our we're starting with P, if P, then Q, our inverse then would look like not P implies not Q. So we are negating each part, meaning we are changing the truth value of the part with our if and the part with our then. And then the last one we have is what is called the contrapositive. So the contrapositive is when you reverse and negate. So we're doing basically both the converse and the inverse. So we are switching the order and we are negating them. So it's going to be it not Q, then not P. All right, so let's talk through some examples. So those, we're going to talk through the examples that are on page 67 in your book. Okay, so we're writing the converse, inverse, and contrapositive of the following conditional. So, if the measure of an angle is 135 degrees, then the angle is obtuse. Okay, so 135 degree angle is an obtuse angle, right? Because it's bigger than 90 and less than 180. So, let's read. So, our converse, we switch that order. Sorry, we switch the order. So if the angle is obtuse, right, so that becomes the first part, then the measure of the angle is 135 degrees. So that's not going to be true, right, because if, it's, if an angle is obtuse, it can be anywhere from 91 to 179. It doesn't have to be 135. So that would be a false statement. So then our inverse, we are negating. So if the measure of an angle is not 135, then the angle is not obtuse. 
right? Again, we don't know that because what if it's 136, right? That angle would be obtuse. So that one is false. Then our contrapositive. So basically, doing the, we're just flipping the inverse back around, right? So if the angle is not obtuse, then its measure is not 135, right? Because if it's not an obtuse angle, that means it can't be 135 because 135 is an obtuse angle. So that would make it true. So for these, you're just negating and flipping, um, which I think you guys will do just fine with. Um, that really wraps up our notes today. You guys will have an assignment tomorrow, and then we will talk more about this and practice more of this together on Monday when we're back in class.